Welcome to another episode of Pour and Tell. This is episode 17. I'm your host, John, the Cigar Surgeon, here as always with my co-host, June Liu. June, what's going on, buddy? What's going on? Happy weekend. Happy weekend. This is morning, yeah. It's nice. Drinking a little coffee there, getting the uh, getting the weekend kicked off. Yeah, getting the, getting the, uh, getting the machine booted back up for today. <laughs> nice. Um, you know, it's been a couple of weeks since we did an episode. Uh, we had a bit of a delay just because of the, uh, President's Day weekend, which was uh, family day weekend here. So we were, we were actually offset a week. No apologies to all our listeners there. Uh, we should be on a regular schedule, uh, provided there's no more holidays coming up. I don't think that's going to be disconnect, but we'll, you guys get that off too. Yeah, we, we have, there are a few holidays that are aligned North and South of the border. Weirdly enough, President's Day is one of them. We have what's called family day, uh-huh. but really it's kind of the dead of winter. So it's really kind of nice to have a three day weekend. I don't particularly care why we're having a three day weekend. I'm just happy to have a three day weekend. So family day. I like family. that. Yeah. yeah. You should recognize that national. Right. So, uh, kicking it off, it's been, it's been a hot couple of weeks. I got into some pours. Uh, one of the ones that kind of seems like a throwaway the wife and I went to a Moroccan restaurant to celebrate Valentine's day. And I'm a big fan of Moroccan food, you know, nice combination of spices. But as always, you know, I'm looking for something to have with dinner. And this was one of those kind of almost throwaways where you're looking on something on the menu that's going to be interesting, but not necessarily take away from the food. And there's a beer that I found. It's from Morocco. It's called uh, Casablanca. Although I think they just call it Casa beer. And like a lot of hot environments, they they mostly just kind of brew lagers or pilsners. And I'm pretty sure this is classified as a pilsner, uh, like a ha- hybrid pilsner lager. Uh, if our audience wants to double check on that, please do and send us an email. But the point of it is, on its own, I don't know that this beer would have necessarily been that amazing. Like it's kind of on the same vein as like a Singha or like the, like I said, typical kind of beer you'd get out of a hot environment, like whether it's Vietnam or Thailand, it's just, it's just a beer to drink when it's really hot and quench your thirst sitting on a patio somewhere. But when you pair it with the combination of spices and flavors that's going on with Moroccan food, it, it provides a really nice balance to the meal. And this is one of those nice pairings where, yeah, the beer is still standing on its own, but it, I'm really drinking it to complement the meal. And I think it did a, a really nice job. Like it had that really crisp, clean flavor to it that wasn't overpowering the palate. And so it brought a little bit out more of the meal and a little bit more, more out of the, the beer for me. I love that. I mean, vast majority of the world drinks, you know, pilsters, lagers, right. Uh, by, by long shot. Um, and uh, I actually really love that. Like I, I distinctly remember like, was it, it's been a while, but last time I went to Nicaragua, and Thailand, uh, which has been like which has been like four or five years ago, like being on a hot day and it really feels like you're quenching your thirst, although you're really not because you should really be drinking water to do so. Or Diet yeah. Coke, right? Yeah, right, Coop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I love it, man. There's just something about that environment and that Christmas of a like cold brewed lager that's just fits the bill. And I think the difference here for me was that. I find with a lot of pilsners, there's almost a, like a metallic undernote to the to the to the flavor, mm. and I'm I'm really sensitive to metallic note, whether it's in beer or whiskey, and I find that very off putting. And I would say this had more of a finish that was almost like you could taste the the grain, so like that nice grainy underlayer to the flavor, so that when you drink it, you're getting that really crisp finish without that lingering tin or iron mm. flavor and Again, when I'm pa- when I'm pairing with a meal, that's kind of what I'm looking for. And I find that, like you said, if I'm in a hot environment, a pilsner or a lager is kind of a go-to. I find oftentimes it's really tough for me to get into a pilsner or a lager. Just, I'm not going to come home and go, you know, man, after an eight-hour shift, I really want a pils. You know, that's just not what I'm typically going for. Huh. I, I feel like we should, though, man. You know, sometimes on a summer hot day, you come back from work, go to the backyard, you're like, hey... I could really open up a nice pilsner. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not like you're you're uh, rush. You're not popping a Russian River, a uh, heavy IPA in that kind of weather. You're not yeah. you're not 
popping <laughs> out a big 10 and a half percent stout because that's exactly <laughs> the wrong thing for your palate. So this, you know, like I said, it was, it was, it was a nice combination with the meal. I really enjoyed it. Nice. But that was kind of a soft lead in to, uh, I have a good friend he knows who he is and he's constantly guinea pigging me with great whiskeys that he's collecting. He's become quite the whiskey fiend, probably putting me to shame at this point. And he had a couple of whiskeys that he poured for me. Uh, the first one was definitely the big winner of the night. And I think it kind of underscores, and you've talked about this, Glendronic in the industry, a lot of people are really picking up on some of the quality releases they're doing. And it's getting kind of the point where, Glendronic puts out a finish or puts out a uh, expression and everyone just kind of snaps it up blind. They don't even taste it. Like it comes out, they announce it, <laughs> you go in and you're like, how many do you have left? And like, well, we got in fit five cases this morning. We have like three bottles left. Yeah. And it's like, okay, apparently Glendronic has become this to whiskey fiends, this kind of fanatic attachment that you don't really see with a lot of brands. All that to say, it, it was a special release. It was a Glendronic 2006. It's only aged 13 years, but it's been aged entirely in a sherry punch and so you get a little bit more wood contact. And I think that really comes through where you get a younger whiskey and it's still, I would say, performing like a 20-year-old, maybe? Mm. Low 20s. This was uh, Cask 3359. It's a bit of a monster. It's 56.7% ABV. So what's that? hundred and just under 104 proof, 105 proof. But the flavor was just so balanced. There was none of that youngness in the sherry, in the, in the whiskey. You didn't get that overwhelming sherry, which sometimes you can go too far with sherry, even though, mm. you know, I do like sherry bombs. You can go too far where all you're tasting is sherry. And this was just that perfect harmony of sherry quality, but you're still getting the spirit coming through good finish, and then a really delayed sherry hit. So you take a sip, let it sit, and then maybe five seconds, six seconds later, boom, that sherry hits you and just gives you that really rich, jammy sweetness that makes you kind of let the glass sit there for a little bit before you take another sip. And mm -hmm. needless to say, really, really nice experience. I'm glad he picked up a few bottles. They are long gone off the market. It's all secondary market, I think, at this point. Yeah. Fucking A, man. FOMO, FOMO will get you. Yeah. <laughs> Every time. The second release was along the same veins from Ben Riek. 2005, it was an exclusive to Calgary Co-op, or Co-op. I think it's specifically Calgary Co-op. And they tend to be overlooked a lot in the marketplace here, which is kind of funny because they have a very strong buying capability. And oftentimes they will get casks or releases that are... I wouldn't say mind blowing, but I'd say they are unique offerings that are high quality. And a lot of people just don't think of them as being sort of this big whiskey seller. And yet there's so many times you can go in there, you can find these gems, you can find these house releases that do perform very, very well. Now I wouldn't say this is necessarily one of them, unfortunately, but it was interesting. It was a his cask 4403. It's a dark rum finish, and I'll get into that in a second. 58.1%, but it's only, I think it's only 10 years. So it's quite young. And it kind of underscored for me the gap with a lot of rum finished whiskeys. And that is the rum isn't necessarily being used to complement the spirit. I think the rum is being used to hide a lot of the ina inadequacies within the spirit, if that makes any sense. Like, for anyone out there who's a huge whiskey fiend, when you, a lot of, I mean, I don't want to be a snob, but most 10 year whiskeys are just not really drinkable to me anymore because when you have a 12 or a 15 or 17, the difference in those couple of years is monster. It monster in terms of the balance of the spirit. You don't get that medicinal quality. You don't get that unbalanced nature. So I think in this case, the rum finish was really to hide a lot of the inadequacies of the spirit. And as a result, really what you got was kind of a, a, a young whiskey that wasn't particularly great. Then you got a overpowering rum capability to it, functionality to it. Can't use words today. So it just, it ended up being this really unbalanced combination with bad, not great spirit, 
and a not great rum finish and they don't combine, they don't harmonize in any way. And I was like, well, it was interesting to try it, but I wouldn't necessarily pick up a bottle because I just, I didn't find it anything special compared to a lot of the other releases that are on the market or available in the market. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I, I, uh, I, I hear you. I it totally, it's kind of seems like it's a quick wave method to turn bottles and whiskey, right? Like you, you mask, uh, basically you mask flavors or you mask, uh, you try to somewhat cheat time within the, the whiskey in the barrel and the age of it. So, um, and, and of course we're talking about like, you know, the, the non-American whiskey world, right? Cause we, cause a lot of these, uh, you know, with scotch, you're using X, a lot of scotch is X bourbon cast, right? Um, whereas American using new char barrels, uh, it imparts that flavor way faster. And also, especially in the Midwest and like Kentucky, Indiana, where all this, a lot of this bourbon comes from, you know, the weather fluctuates drastically more so than Scotland does. So, yeah. And I think that's a two, two things to touch on there. One, I think masking, that's a great, that's a great terminology. Cause that's exactly what I think they're trying to do is they're trying to mask the, the things in that whiskey that's not good. And you're exactly right. You can't, you could release a 10 year bourbon and it's going to be spectacular. You release a 10 year whiskey it's probably just okay at the best. It's very rare that you would pick up a 10 year and find it as good as a five year or 15, five year old or 15 year whiskey. And that's kind of the drawback, unfortunately, when you're heavy into scotch is that you really can't compare a scotch age statement to a bourbon age statement because I mean, man, a 10 year bourbon is probably going to be a pretty spectacular bourbon more often oh, yeah, than not. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's where bourbon hits the stride for me is, when you kind of reach that 10 year to that 12, 10 to that 10 to 13 year, like something just really special happens. So, yep. so that was, it was fun. Like I said, it, it, you know, whether it's good or bad or somewhere in between, that's part of the fun for me is just trying new things, expanding the palette, trying to challenge yourself to see, you know, do I, do I find a particular character out of this that I like? Is it unbalanced? Is it something special? And I think you, you gotta, sometimes you gotta try stuff that you, Maybe no one advanced it isn't necessarily going to be very good, but that's part of the fun is experimenting with stuff that maybe is outside of your wheelhouse or maybe stuff that is in your wheelhouse and you already kind of know going into it. This might not be very good, but I like that. I, I think it's sometimes it's those not great whiskeys that really puts a shine, puts a, a bright flashlight on the really great whiskeys out there because you really start to really appreciate you know, like that Glendronic, which is only 13 years. And to me, that Glendronic was just a million miles away from the Ben Rayek in terms of quality. Like I would take that Glendronic hands down. It's not even a competition. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's Glendronic's and, and just got a greater brown form. And I, like, I, I think we talked about this last episode. I, they're just killing it, yep. man. Like they're listening to their, uh, uh, enthusiasts, you know, the fellow drinkers, their customers, um, they know they have a handle on what they want to do for direction. Like, you know, I'm talking about brown former, of course, in the sense of their scotch side of things and bourbon side of things, right? What for reserved and uh, as well as like Lynchonic, right? So, yeah, it's a good job. Yeah, I, th I think, and you hit the nail on the head, especially with the Woodford. It's clear to me that, and this kind of goes into the conversation between craft and not craft, they're really putting the spirit first that is they're not at least they don't seem focused on releasing something just for money unless they're happy with the quality that's released and as a result you can kind of do that thing where you buy a woodford blind you buy a glendronic blind and you're like at the very least this is going to be good if it's not mm -hmm. great so i'm not gonna yeah. regret that purchasing decision after the fact yeah it's like you, you know buying blind more cases than not uh i mean you know palette being subjective, you know, you're going to get a quality product, yep. right? hundred yeah. percent. So what do you got going on the last couple of weeks for, for pour and tell pours? Yeah. Um, had quite a bit of like pretty rare stuff, uh, allocated, rare, expensive. I can't find the bottle. So I went to the bar drink it kind of <laughs> thing. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, first one beer. So within the last couple of weeks, uh, it's uh, so once a year, uh, so I'm in the Bay area in Northern California, uh, and there's this thing called uh, San Francisco Beer Week. So basically, within these two weeks, 
like all of these local breweries uh, and even some of the other like breweries uh, within the last couple of years, like in Pacific Northwest, for instance, like Great Notion, uh, even like uh, Alchemist in uh, Vermont that makes Heidi Topper and all that, like they'll send their special beers and our local breweries will make special beers to celebrate these two weeks. So a lot of the beer that comes from this, these two weeks is uh, namely a lot of like Imperial IPAs, uh, triple IPAs. Um, so that's a big part of it. Uh, and just special beers, whether it's sours or, uh, you know, more like special stouts and that kind of thing. So um, as a part of this, uh, with two week celebration, this is every, this is when Russian River will release their Pliny the Younger. Uh, so which is their uh, triple IPA slash Imperial IPA that only comes out within these two weeks. Um, it's highly sought after, uh, shit long lines, um, but within the last, I think last year, they opened up a different brewery, a different producing bre- uh, brewery within like 20 minutes of their original brewery location. So this this year, there's definitely way more kegs that went out to vendors. Um, so as a part of that, uh, I went, <laughs> I got up at a, a six in the morning on a Saturday uh, because uh, I have this cousin that it's his tradition to go to this local bar near us and uh doors open at 8 30 a.m people usually land up by like six wow. uh to get their two 10 ounce pours of Pliny the younger so this is this is and, uh this is straight off the tap line like this isn't a bottle pour yeah. this is yeah so they, they actually this is the first time in which they bottled it this year but in order to get a bottle you had to go to one of their two breweries and you have to like dine dine slash drink there and you get the opportunity to buy the bottles uh but the crappy part about that is they're within the two weeks that they released pliny uh the, the younger <clears throat> at both of their locations um at a minimum there'll be about a two to three hour wait at any po- given point when they're open at 8 30 in the morning yeah wow so uh i i'm just I'm not going to do that. Uh, but with the whole thing, like with my cousin, I figured, hey, he's like, dude, like, come on, man. Like, I do this every year. It's been like four years running. Um, you know, I'll bring you a lawn chair. We go camp out there and I'll bring <laughs> us coffee, blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, he was able to, I was able to do that with him, uh, with a couple of others, his buddies that were really cool. So, yeah, we got there at six in the morning. Um, dude, it is so fucking cold <laughs> to be out there at <laughs> six in the morning. I remember sitting in the lawn chair. I was in a hoodie and I was in sweats. Um, and I was like, God, Randy, like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> but uh, but it, the, the time went pretty fast. Uh, we were just chatting and, you know, catching up, which is really good. Um, and these are, these are monster anyways. ABVs, right? Yeah. So this year it's a 10.25, uh, like 10.2% um this year came in at so wow. the thing about being at this brewery that's uh it's this place called first street ale house near me um uh, they so because it's a pub uh they tap all the other special beers as well oh boy uh, from other breweries uh so we went in there and we drank of course you know we first sat there sat down uh stomach was just full of just coffee uh so 8 30 in the morning and we have our younger uh so we have a 10.2 percent uh imperial ipa That's one way to start which is yeah i uh do my day was fucking shot by like i remember coming home at like noon and i was fucking drunk man <laughs> i was like and then i just like went to take a nap and i go woke up and i was like man it's 3 p.m i don't want to do anything so i went to like go smoke a cigar <laughs> Um, anyway, so it's the actual uh, planning the younger. It was uh, so I, I thought this year was uh, what's really greatly known and kind of surprising about younger is for how big of a beer it is. Um, it is incredibly smooth, right? And especially when you get to like that level of imperial IPA, like to me, it could taste kind of like uh, too overly sweet, mm-hmm. like multi sweet. Uh, and or it could taste um, kind of like soapy almost, right? right? Like metallic soapy. Uh, but younger doesn't they, – they, they brew it so well that you don't really have that. What's interesting about this here is um, – so the first part we had was the younger, and immediately I kind of thought, man, this is a little sharp for uh, what I remember from previous years. And then we ordered three other uh, triple IPAs from other uh, like well-known local breweries. Um and after tasting it in a flight, um, 
and then I was able to really confidently say, oh, you know, the younger is still the best one out of all of these. So it's still a wonderful beer. Um, you know, next year, uh, I'll probably do it again just because, you know, it's not really about like waiting. For me, it's not really about like waiting for the beer, camping out, any of that kind of shit. It's more about like getting an opportunity to like hang out with my cousin and some of his buddies that I've gotten to know. Um, so, you know, if, uh, if given an opportunity, I'll probably do it again next year because it was, it was fun. Nice. So nice. That sounds like a fun um, experience. Yeah, it was. It was a. Uh, it was crazy because after that younger, we ordered immediately, like within this one hour span, three other triple IPAs from different breweries, and it was just like, yeah, it, game on, it, son, game yeah, on. It was, dude. I and I even told Randy, and I was like, dude, I was like, I'm, I don't really usually do this. He's like, yeah, yeah, I know. He's like, I do this once here, and I was like, okay, yeah, because he's like, I think I will become a very shitty person if i do this all the yeah, time yeah well so. and, i mean like you said starting starting the day i mean i like my beer and i like my whiskey but there's a difference between drinking a whiskey or a big beer like that in the afternoon after lunch and starting your day off with something that monster <laughs> especially when you add on extra flights to that you're you're off to the races and as you say yeah. you come out of there and you're just completely smashed yeah the, you know what the cool thing is um uh, at this pub uh, just because of this event, um, they actually do a, a, a buffet style breakfast. Oh, nice. Um, so we were able to get in on that, uh, which is very much needed, but even get, I mean, like, even like having that spread of buffet, which is a really good buffet, actually, um, you know, well worth the, like whatever 12 bucks that they charged, uh, I just I can't really stomach much like a ton of food, but and by the time I was able to get hungry, I'm already pretty buzzing for the beer, yeah, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so, but it was good to have. It was needed, let's just say. Nice. So, okay. So, a uh, couple other things. So, kind of moving away from the beer world. A um, couple of bourbons I've had. Um, so, first one, you know, going back to like us talking about Brown Foreman. Um, I had their uh, Old Forster uh, 2019 birthday bourbon. Um, so, the birthday bourbon that comes out of Old Forster is released once a year. Uh, it's usually released within the fall, which is when all the allocated bourbons come out. Um, so, this bottle, um, I. I mean, I basically strike out on trying to get a bottle of beer of this, but um, I was up um, about like an hour and a half north of here uh, at a little wine town called Hillsburg. Um, I was at a bar there uh, and they had it. It was pretty well priced. Uh, tried it. You know, this is probably my fourth year trying a vertical of this birthday bourbon. Uh, and my overall thoughts, and I think I'm in the minority, is I, I'm just not that I don't know. Like, it, I feel like I always feel like it should be better. Is it good? Yeah. Old Forster in general, as a brand, is very good. Uh, they're low range to high range, excellent. Um, but you know, there's just something about this bourbon. While it just kind of felt like it was, I, I'm really not a fan of uh, whiskeys in general that dries out my palate Ooh. and gives like a bittering finish, like a dry bittering finish. Gotcha. Um, and that's exactly what I got it as on the finish, which kind of killed it for me. But nonetheless. Happy to try it. And when I see it again for next year at a bar, I'll try it again. Now, what, when you say bitterness, like, would you describe that as kind of the astringency you get from, like, grapefruit, where it's that that sort of... Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's almost like uh, like you eat, like a, like, a citrus rind, right? Like, it really cakes your palate with bitterness, and it just, like, kind of, you know, uh, it's almost like in cotton mouthy, yep. you know? Yeah. Um. Next one is another bourbon. Uh, same bar I was there. Uh, it was a Buffalo Trace Weller. Uh, they they came out with uh, Weller Full Proof, which is not barrel proof, but close to that. Uh, so this product, uh, it's a weeded bourbon. Uh, it came out, I think, like the middle of last year or like Q3 of last year. But, you know, I remember this thing came out. So I follow a couple of these like local uh, wine shops in which they have like a product feed online. Uh, I remember this came up and not even within one minute after they posted it, like it sold out <laughs> like 30 some bottles. Uh, so, you know, um, which is not surprising and I'm not about to buy this on secondary. So MSRP for this is, I think somewhere in like 60 range, uh, $60. What's the secondary dollars. market like on that? Secondary is like three fifty. dollars right insane. now. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just, I'm not doing that. I'm, I, I refuse to buy secondary. I really do. Like even, you know, maybe if I was like fucking ridiculous rich and had ridiculous disposable income, like I will absolutely go out there and I'll fucking 
you know, hunt down black arts that McEwen had when he was around, like anything, right? So, but not buying it for that secondary. But uh, I, well, you know what's sad about this? It's like I was trying it at the bar and I was like, wow, this is really good. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I was, I keep sniffing it, sniffing it. I got a four, you know, proper one and a half ounce dram of it. Um, and I kept sniffing it and tasting it. And I was like, man, this is like the boldness of the increased alcohol. Uh, like the ABV and the proof, uh, the finish is so much more bigger and longer. Uh, and for a minute, I was like, "Fuck!" Like, should I just like, should I go search on secondary and maybe try to find something? And then I snapped that, and I was like, "Dude, no, don't do it." Don't do it. <laughs> um, and last but not least, uh, I had a uh, speaking of Glendronic as well. Um, I had the Glendronic uh, Batch Eight Cast Strength. So this is their. I don't think this is necessarily yearly release. I think it's more like either yearly or like like every two year release that they do. So uh, this is you know non H stated uh, Glendronic, uh, typical Glendronic. It's you know sherry cast, uh, but this is cast strength. So uh, for this guy, um, Jimenez, uh, Pedro Jimenez, and Oloroso sherry cast, nice. uh, natural cast strength, non chill filtered. Um, so this guy is clocking in at hold up that like uh, hold up that. For our audience, yeah, nice. Yeah, so this is our uh, this is like a sixty-one percent, like hundred twenty-two proof. That's no joke. Uh, price wise, it's uh, eighty-nine. Wait, yeah, eight. I think it's like eighty dollars MSRP around here, or even ninety dollars MSRP. Um, I was able to recently score a few. So this is the story. I, I bought one from a big box store, Total Wine. And I came home and I immediately opened it. And I had to get a taste of it. Uh, shamelessly, uh, I, I'll fully admit, when I tasted it, I was on antibiotics. But I nosed it and I put it in my mouth, but I spit. But I had to taste it at that point because I thought... And by the way, when I was on antibiotics, the doctor specifically said don't drink alcohol, yeah. right? So, which is why I didn't swallow it. Um, so I tasted it because FOMO kicked in. And I was like, shit, if this is really good, uh, they're going to run out. So I need to taste this right now. Yeah, that's what happens. So I, I tasted it. <laughs> I tasted it. And then uh, I was like, fuck, man, I got to get more. Uh, so I went back um, and I got uh, five more bottles <laughs> the next day. <laughs> and I left like two of them there. Wow. Um, so, man, this is, I think if I were to talk, think about kind of like whiskeys that I've had within this last year or so, uh, this is definitely like top two, top three for me. Um, you know, unbeatable for the price point. I actually got it at $70 a bottle because, you know, I'm a coupon user nice. and good, I used to coupon. Good for you, buddy. Good for you. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, you're talking about uh, the density of uh, jammy, like stewed fruit, uh, chocolate finish. It's almost like a chocolate raspberry covered sort of a finish. Uh, it is uh, like just, it, it's so much power of those sherry casts, but it doesn't overdo it. Uh, but it's incredibly full flavored and full bodied. Uh, long, long finish. Um, man, I, I, I could, if I didn't have anything to do for one of the days, I think I'd probably drink half this bottle and just be absolutely happy watching Netflix. Well, I think, I think the nice thing about cast strength is if you're the kind of drinker who doesn't, and, and this is no shame because drinking whiskeys above 53, 54, those are, those are big, big drams. And not everyone can necessarily do that because it's just too big on the palate. So I think there's a, if you think about the value component, when most whiskeys are at 40, 43% ABV, really what you're talking about is if you were to actually bring that ABV down, even to 45, 46, 47, you're almost getting the value of a bottle and a half of whiskey or one bottle, maybe even a bottle and three quarters, depending on what your ratio of water to whiskey is. So that's where I say, like, I don't think there's any shame in a 61% big, big, big whiskey, bring it down a little bit you're still getting the essence of that cast strength, which to me is the most important thing. And then you're determining whether you want to bring that down a little bit, add a little bit of water, maybe that's better for your palate. But I think to me, I'm really into the firmly into the cask strength only territory where unless it's cask strength, 
I kind of am not interested anymore in, in the offering. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, in addition to what you're saying, totally agree with what you're saying. Um, I also think that when you buy cast strength, it's almost uh, you. I think, in my opinion, you should water it down and see where it's at and see what it tastes like, right? Because, you know, oftentimes when you water a whiskey down, unless if you're buying like eighty proof, um, you know, you actually get way more of the flavors that come out of it, right? You're uh, you're able to identify more uh, intricacies of a whiskey because you're you're tapering down that alcohol sting. Um, and honestly, man, like some days. Uh, like I'll admit, like some days as a whiskey drinker, I don't want it at cast strength, yeah. right? Like I don't want that bite. I want it easy going, you know, pour pour drams in front of the TV, right, and just or sit in the backyard and just enjoy it instead of like needing to, you know, wanting to deal with the heat, right? Because yeah. some of the some of the great cast strength bottles that I have, especially in the bourbon world, um, they're great whiskeys, but not it, they're actually better for me when I proof it down slightly a little bit. Absolutely. Yep, so, totally agreed. No. Well, that sounds like a good couple of weeks. Okay, and so we're talking about shared whiskeys, so it kind of naturally fits into our libation news slash discussion this week. I was on Reddit, and there was an interesting conversation on, I think it was our whiskey or our scotch. I think it was our whiskey. One of the things that came up was there's someone there that is particularly sensitive to sulfur. Now, for those who aren't huge, huge geeks into shared whiskey... Sometimes what can happen is when you're buying a sherry punchin or a sherry butt, they've put, and I, I think I've heard that the reason they do this is that it's supposed to get rid of some of the spare bacteria that's still sitting in the cask. I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's the rumor I've heard. They essentially light a sulfur stick and the sulfur is supposed to get rid of that bacteria. The problem is that that sulfur immediately leaches into the cask. And for people who, I don't want to call myself a super taster, I would say that I'm particularly sensitive to certain things. I'm sensitive to lavender. I'm sensitive to sulfur. Those are flavors that come out immediately for me. And I've been at tastings before where there's a shared whiskey and I don't even have to bring it up to my nose from the table I can smell the sulfur from the whiskey. Now, if, if you either like sulfur in your whiskey or it doesn't bother you, power to you because that certainly expands the range of product that's available to you because there are certainly some older whiskeys and some newer whiskeys that have that, I call it sulfated, a sulfated component. This particular person was talking about that. So I guess first off, right out of the hopper, where are you on the sulfur scale, sulfur sensitivity when it comes to sherry whiskeys? You know, I, uh, hmm. I'm not sure if I'm sensitive, as sensitive to it as you are. Um, but I understand your sensitivity of certain notes more from, uh, the cigar world, right? right? Like I am in the cigar world. I'm incredibly sensitive to bitterness in a cigar. Right. Um, but that also is to say, you know, it's okay to have some bitterness, but if you have that and it's absolutely like palate destroying and it takes over the rest of the profile of that particular cigar, or even in this case, the spirit, uh, then that's where, uh, the fault is at. Right? Yeah. Um, that's where it gets bad. Yeah. I think for me, unfortunately, because of the nature of the way that my nose and palate interacts, I really can't even do a little bit of sulfur. It, it, it immediately gives me sort of that stomach churning reaction and it really takes over the nuances of the whiskey for me. And for those who aren't aware, I mean, part of the reason why you use a copper pot still is because at least, and again, this is coming from when it's in the cask. So once it's in the cask, there's not a lot you can do about it, but when it's in the actual, uh, when it's in the actual still, the copper actually serves to interact with the spirit and get rid of a lot of undesirable compounds. I mean, that's the whole reason you're using copper is that copper negates those compounds. So if the sulfur was actually in the spirit, then the copper would take care of that. It reacts, it creates uh, copper, copper sulfide, I think, and essentially neutralizes it. The problem is that once it's in the cask, there's not much you can do. You can, and so the, the reason this comes up is because this particular person uh, came up with the idea, which is somewhat questionable, of dis- 
they they took the bottle of whiskey and they decanted it in some copper wire. Now, there's some serious concerns there because copper on its own is actually toxic. You you really don't like if you had a copper vessel like a copper glass, you would not want to drink out of that unless it was covered in a I think it has to be covered in a particular metal or something because as it interacts with with a liquid you can ingest copper and if you ingest copper copper is actually incredibly toxic like like causes brain damage causes organ failure so it kind of came up in the conversation that like look it's interesting that you were able to get rid of some of the sulfur compounds in the whiskey the problem now is that you may have created something that could possibly be toxic to you as a result i I definitely applaud the ingenuity because there there are whiskeys that I would love to, if I could magically remove that sulfur from the whiskey, try it again. Unfortunately, as as far as I'm aware, once that sulfur is in the whiskey because of the cask, you can't do anything. It's it is what it is. So you either have to live with it or move on to another move on to another whiskey, which is um, unfortunate. Yeah. So like it, yeah. So like I said, I mean, if you, if you don't, if you don't mind sulfur, then power to you. But I do find that there are a number of whiskeys and I I was actually at a Port Ellen tasting some time ago and Port Port Ellen being a closed distillery, there were some brilliant, brilliant ex sherried whiskeys there. Unfortunately, there were a handful of whiskeys where, like I said, before I even brought the nose, the glass up to my nose, immediately got the sulfur. And to me, I just, I, like I had a couple sips and I'm like, I can't, I can't drink this. Like it's literally undrinkable for me. So, you know, hand it off to somebody else who doesn't mind as much. It'd be nice to know in advance. That's I think kind of the benefit of going to tastings is that you can try the whiskey before you buy it. Cause man, I would hate to drop two, three, four hundred dollars on a whiskey and then find out that for me, it's undrinkable. Rough situation. Yeah. So, yeah. I hear you. In other interesting news, and this comes to us via Whiskey Advocate. They have a lot of great bourbon whiskey spirit news. They were talking about Woodford Reserve is rolling out a 2020 batch proof. So I I guess this is an annual release. And it was named uh, number six in their top 20 in 2019 for Whiskey Advocate. So it's a limited edition. uh, And, you know, in the spirit industry, limited means... Once it's gone, it's gone. It doesn't mean, you know, limited production and then maybe they'll come out with some more. It's truly limited. So they're saying that the 2021 bottling, and that's when they're they're saying it's going to come out as 2021. It's pretty reasonable, 130 bucks. So if you are into Woodford Reserve, and it sounds like the previous versions of this have scored quite well, only 130 bucks. So if you're kind of in, into that limited bourbon, I mean, that's probably one to hop on pretty quick. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, what for, especially within their master collection, they do a lot of experimental stuff. Uh, they also had these ones. This is probably the most consistently good one that they come out with. So, you know, uh, for me, this is all speaking personally, of course. Uh, you know, for this, for someone like this, I'll, I'll happily buy without uh, tasting it at a bar. Yeah, me too. I think Woodford is one of those companies that i can feel confident buying it blind and i'm going to have at minimum a good experience there's there's really no time i'm going to buy a woodford i'm going to regret that purchasing decision later yeah yep so if you have the money we're getting into some some sort of crazy releases along with that news glenfiddich is releasing a rare collection of 1975 vintage which is my birth year now i've owned a Glenfiddich 30 year 1975 and I bought it some years ago and we ended up crushing it at my stag finishing what was left and not crushing it but finishing what was left it was certainly a lot more affordable so this this particular re-release release is cask number 4706 and 5114 for those who keep track of that stuff 44 years old 54.7% ABV on the 4706 and 40, 48% ABV on the 5114. So these are true cask strengths. And the reason that the cask 5114, it's just lost alcohol over that 44 year of aging. Now, you better get a credit card out because these bottles are $9,000 each. Damn. Yeah. There is. That's incredibly high. That's incredibly for, high. And Glenfiddich also has like. 
they have a pretty decent amount of like higher aged whiskeys out they there. Do. But this one is a significant jump over the other ones. <laughs> so if you care to buy these, uh, there is going to be a hundred bottles of each of those casks available in the United States. They've, they've allocated a hundred, hundred bottles to the American market. Uh, it is available now that is in February that's hitting the market. I can imagine these are going to be snapped up. I don't think there are people willing to drop $9,000 in a bottle. So I, I don't think this is quite like the Woodford where these are going to sell in the first couple of weeks. But if you are a fanatic to that level, I would say this is probably one to investigate. I, I've had a lot of older Glenfiddichs. I've never been disappointed. These sound pretty spectacular. Uh, if $9,000 is no no big deal to you, then hop on it. I think I have a Glenfiddich uh, 30-year-old somewhere. That's a good dram. And, yeah, I'm not... Was that a cast strength? I don't, I don't think so. I, I bought that a long time ago. No, I don't think that Okay, I don't think so either. I doubt yeah. it. No, it's not. I just looked it up. It's not. Um, I actually bought that for my 30th birthday a few nice. years ago. Yeah, that's... I told myself a little short, short, short story. I told myself back in the day when I was like 28, 29, uh, I was like, every year it's my birthday. I'm going to find that exact year of a whiskey and I'm going to buy it wow. to, to enjoy my, you know, to kind of go through that journey. Right. Um, but I stopped after 30 cause I was like, and back then I made less money than I do now. <laughs> and it was kind of getting expensive. I was like, oh, fuck. Like, I got to go find like a 35-year-old whiskey now. I was like, oh, no, I'm good. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in the same vein. It was certainly a lot more affordable 10 or ten or even five years ago than it is today. So I <laughs> yeah. think that tradition is is shot for me as well. I don't think I'll be drinking a birth year. At least I won't be buying a birth year. I might taste it as, as a one-time special pour at a bar or something, but I'm, I don't think I'm acquiring a bottle of those anytime soon. Ditto. Last but not least, kind of uh, again in the high roller vein of whiskeys, this comes to us by the uh, website independent.co.uk. So there was a big announcement. Of course, everyone likes to talk about McAllen, McAllen. And so they had a, a very, very old bottle of McAllen. And this was cask 263. Curiously, I don't have the age there. I think it's, I think if I remember, it's 60 years old. So for those who aren't aware, old McAllen has been very hard to come by for some time and really anything over 25 years now has become pretty, pretty unaffordable. So unless you're getting a secondary bottling, independent bottler, it's unlikely you're going to find something that's over 25 years for anything less than, you know, $500 plus. So, uh, I think the, right. So this was bottled in 1986, cask number 263. And they only got 40 bottles out of it, which makes sense because it's, you know, I think it's 60 years old. So that, that tracks, uh, this was, oh, in fact, the, the math is right there. So it was originally put in the cask in 1926, bottled 1986. So there you go, 60 years. So this was sold by Sotheby's, which is a big auction house. And they had estimated that it would go for 350,000 to 450,000 pounds, which I feel like that estimate is way on the low side because I've known... Yeah, much much younger whiskeys in the forty to forty five year range to go for you know two hundred fifty to three hundred fifty thousand pounds. So I almost feel like they maybe kind of under hmm. undervalued that maybe just to get the market hyped. At any rate, this went for an astounding one point five million pounds at auction. One point five million pounds. Man. That is, and that's in pounds. That's in pounds. Right? So that you double, basically so double like, that, or one and a half times for American dollars. So like, would that be two, two, two point two, two point four million U.S. dollars? Jeez. I only hope, sincerely, that the person that bought this intends to open it and share it with their closest friends, because to me, the worst, and this is just my personal feeling, but. To me, the worst possible thing can be this wonderful, amazing 60-year-old whiskey from the turn of the century put into a cask, and it just sits in a display case somewhere in somebody's cool, fancy wine cellar as a pedestal topper for the next 20, 30, whatever years, and 
never gets open, never gets drank. To me, that would just be tragic. Yeah. By the way, it's 1.5 US dollars, which is insane. And you know what? You know what? I actually thought when I first read this, uh, after you posted it on our little show notes, uh, I thought, uh, I was like, what if it's fake? Because <laughs> we just had that discussion about, you know, uh, counterfeiting and all that. <laughs> I mean, I have to assume that Sotheby's must have gone, th- like, with a whiskey that, that that's, first of all, that old. Uh, I guess the benefit here is it's coming directly from the distillery. So yeah. you have a little bit more confidence. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> dropping that kind of money, you better hope it's authentic. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, crazy. Uh, I'm sure I will never in my life ever taste something quite that old, but it's exciting to think that there's somebody out there with a bottle, and maybe if you're, if you're good friends, maybe one day you'll you'll try it. Who knows? Anything's Can you possible. Imagine? I can't. That dude, I would I would probably like, I'll probably stick my tongue down in that glass and I'll lick every single uh-huh. surface of it afterwards. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you have to you'd have to pour that and put a cover on the glass and let it sit for like an hour or two, because mm. I just. Yeah, I mean, if it, I gosh, a pour of that, I mean, I could see myself taking an hour to drink it just because, like you said, you'd pretty much want every single drop. I mean, a single no. drop of that's going to be worth like ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars, like just insanity. That's yeah, incredible, incredible. So that's it for our pour and tell segment libation news this week. Uh, thanks very much. For Everyone who tuned in, both on YouTube and Facebook, of course, all of our podcast listeners out there, you know where to subscribe, otherwise you wouldn't be hearing us right now, but uh, you can check out all our cigar content if that's your thing at developingpallets.com. And as always, we'll be back in a couple of weeks.